Dr. Daniel Bowles from the Rocky Mountain Regional VA Medical Center to talk to us about head and neck cancers. This is, that's right. This is, I feel, it feels a little bit like, you know, when you go to graduation, they say, please hold your applause to the end. And like every time a kid goes past the family, it's like, forget you, we're cheering. So like, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's fun to see uh, so many people here that uh, I, from different walks of life in my journey here in Colorado. So um, I really appreciate being here. So I'm, I'm here to talk about head and neck cancer. I let Bree put up all the gory pictures, so I will have fewer gory pictures. Because, um, you know, following up sarcoma gore with head and neck gore, nobody needs that. Um, so I, in terms of my talk, I, I gave Sarah a panic attack because uh, on Monday I asked her what she wanted me to talk about, and I, I nearly <laughs> killed her. But, but more, more specifically is, you know, what, all of us who do whatever we do for a living, you know, we can kind of talk for hours and hours and hours, but that's not always very helpful. Um, so my question was, like, what do you guys want to know about head and neck cancer? So uh, this talk is based mostly on what I was told that you guys wanted to hear. If not, you can uh, save your tomatoes for the end. So we'll cover some basics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what happens from someone when they, from the time they get diagnosed, kind of through the end of their journey from a curative intent standpoint, uh, because there's a lot of navigating and figuring stuff out and coordination, uh, I think, with head and neck cancer, even more so I th than with some other cancers. Uh, we'll touch on a little bit of what happens when these darn things come back and then kind of wax uh, sentimental about some things that could be happening down the road. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time at the end for questions uh, so you can uh, ask until your heart's uh, content. So uh, when we're talking about head and neck cancers, we're mostly talking about squamous cell carcinomas. So that's the, the cell that lines our respiratory mucosa, mouth, you know, nasal cavity, upper airways, uh, top of the esophagus. So those, they're squamous cell carcinomas. We don't, have, unlike Dr. Wilkie, who has literally like 100,000 different histologies to deal with, we have one. Uh, they, uh, we, when you think about head and neck cancers, we break it down by, uh, by region. So we think about oral cavity cancers, so that would be your mobile tongue, so the part of the tongue that flaps around that you can see when you open your mouth, the floor of your mouth, so that spot right underneath your tongue, your gingiva and your palate, so those are the oral cavity. There's your oropharynx. Your oropharynx is basically your tonsils and the base of your tongue. So the part of your tongue right behind where you can see, so the ENTs can see it with a mirror exam or doing a fiber optic exam. And then uh, we talk about the hypopharynx, which is basically right beyond that. And then when, you're, uh, when you, your, your airway splits off into your esophagus and your uh, trachea, you end up getting to your, uh, your larynx or your glottic larynx. So those are the four main areas that we think about. There are other areas like sinuses, we, which don't come up as frequently, and actually very little study has been studied about those. So that's what we think about. And we spend a lot of time uh, in our tumor boards and talking with the surgeons, trying to define, okay, do we really think that this is a tons, uh, an oral cavity cancer, or do we think this is more of a base of tongue cancer that grew forward? Or do we think this is more of a hypopharyngeal cancer that's growing upwards, or an oropharyngeal cancer that's growing backwards? Um, so it's really important that we, we really lean on our, uh, on our surgeons to help us figure that out. In terms of risk factors for uh, head and neck cancer, so this is, the, this is the disease of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So you get it, um, the, the classic risk factors are tobacco use, so smoking, chewing tobacco. Uh, if you are in uh, the Indian subcontinent, they have a lot of betel nut chewing, uh, which people will often mix it uh, with tobacco products, so that's a big risk factor um, in that region. Uh, alcohol, so however people ingest that, and then um, HPV infection. So HPV is a uh, sexually transmitted infection. It's the leading cause of cervical cancer. Uh, but over the last 25 years, it's really uh, the demographics have shifted so that actually head and neck cancers are now the most common HPV positive malignancy uh, in the world. So, and that's, it's sexually transmitted. So that's how people get it. And then in terms of staging, you know, we stage head and neck cancers just like uh, most other solid tumors. So you know, what's the, where's the tumor, what's its size, how many lymph nodes are involved, what do those lymph nodes look like, and do we think it's spread? Now, head and neck, we like to be a little extra complicated because most of the time we go from stage one to four C. We actually have three different types of stage four. Uh, stage one through four B, we treat with the intent of curing people. Uh, four C's are people who have distant metastatic disease, and our, our goals are usually different in that setting. Uh, the staging varies based on tumor type, so it's a little bit, or location, so it's a little bit different if it's in your oral cavity or your larynx. Uh, and then it also depends upon what your HPV status is. So I, this is, this is uh, kind of a typical patient, so maybe a 58-year-old guy, 
uh, who had a slowly developing mass in his neck, went to go see his PCP. Uh, they looked in the back of his throat, saw this thing uh, and the, his right uh, base of tongue, like tonsil or pillar area, uh, and then got this MRI. Now this guy that wasn't a smoker, wasn't a drinker, you know, a healthy guy otherwise, kind of your, your, your average person. So here's how the process usually goes. And you know, different, uh, you know, we got lots of, lots of nurses in the, in, in the audience, and many of you, how many of you guys are like uh, chemo infusion nurses? How many of you are clinic nurses? How many of you do something else which is also amazing that I don't know about? <laughs> okay, um, so I, I know there are lots of nurse navigators in here, and this is, I will say, we, we rely, whether I'm wearing my VA hat or I'm wearing my university hat, uh, we rely heavily on our nurse navigators because this process is complicated. So typically the way it works is someone comes in with a suspicious mass, right? Lump, bump, something in their mouth. They get nervous. They see their primary care doctor. Usually they'll say, like, oh, it's probably an infection. You get some antibiotics. It doesn't get better. And then they say, oh, it's probably not an infection. And then they get, they get you know, an ultrasound, a CAT scan, MRI, something like that. They see something scary. They say, okay, you need to go see the ear, nose, and throat doctor. Ear, nose, and throat doctor sees them and says, well, this doesn't look great. Let's biopsy something. And they can do that biopsy in lots of different ways. If it's in the mouth or the, the tonsils or the base of the tongue, they can actually do it in clinic. Um, if it's further down, so it's a, if there's something suspicious on the voice box or in the hypopharynx, that's a pretty sensitive area to try to biopsy in the clinic. So you, they'll usually do that in the operating room. And if there are lymph nodes in the neck, uh, if they're palpable, the ENTs can often biopsy that uh, in clinic, either just blindly or with an ultrasound. Or if it's deeper or they don't feel comfortable with it, they'll send them to uh, interventional radiology to get biopsy. So suspicious mass, imaging, ENT, biopsy something. Then, the pio then when they do the biopsy, of course, they look at it under the microscope in all the usual ways, particularly if it's a cancer of the oropharynx. So again, the tonsil or the base of the tongue. Uh, it's critically important to get HPV testing. When we look at the HPV testing, we don't usually actually test for HPV specifically. There's a surrogate test that we use called P16. So when you're looking at, if you're looking at one of my notes or you're hearing something, you know, people talking, they'll say, okay, this is a P16 positive head and neck cancer. And we'll say, okay, that's an HPV positive. It's just, P16 is uh, a lot cheaper to get. It's uh, readily available throughout the world. Uh, and it's a really good marker in general. So that's why that's done uh, more, more commonly. And then at that point, basically, uh, uh, I would I'd say all hell breaks loose, but like a lot of stuff gets, starts getting activated in a very quick period of time. So usually once that diagnosis is made, they've already usually established with an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, but they get referred to radiation oncology, medical oncology, and I always tell patients, it feels like you're running around with your hair on fire for a little bit of time because there's just so much stuff happening in the short term. So I, this, is, this is, you know, where uh, y'all come in, which is like every step of the way. I know I was like, oh, so-and-so needs to, you know, get this done. And I, my nurse, I was like, all right, we're on it. And I talked to so -and -so, I talked to this person, I talked to this person. Because there's just, like, there's so many different people involved. Um, for instance, so you get this head and, you know, HNSCC, so that's head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. So when people get diagnosed with this, they usually have to see about eight different groups of healthcare providers almost everybody. So everyone ends up seeing an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. Everyone basically ends up seeing radiation oncology at some point. Almost everyone ends up seeing medical oncology. There are some maybe caveats to that. Everyone ends up needing to see speech language pathology. People can end up with a lot of swallowing problems during this process and getting ahead of the game is critically important and then dealing with it as you're going along is helpful. So everyone needs to see speech. Everyone needs to see dental. Uh, unless you have no teeth. If you have no teeth, then you don't need to worry about uh, But the, the, these can cause a lot of dental problems. And we spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, what can we do to help maintain people's dental health during their therapy? Nutrition. Right? I say a really good way to lose a lot of weight is to go on head and neck chemo radiation, but it's also kind of a miserable way to lose a lot of weight. Um, so it's really important for us to make sure that people are maintaining their nutrition as best they can during that process. And that is a multi-person job, right? That is the nurses in clinic. That's the nurse and navigators who are helping them out. That's the dietitians who are seeing them in the infusion clinic all the time. That's their significant others who are saying, I'm sorry, it's your job to eat right now. It's the kids who are like, oh, okay, we're gonna get two feeds. Like, it's the, whole, it's the whole party that has to get people involved. Smoking cessation, right? People who keep smoking during their head and neck cancer therapy uh, have a 15% uh, decreased chance of being cured. So even if they were smoking up to the day they started radiation, stopping smoking helps uh, improve their chances of being cured. So that's critically important. And then social work. A lot of our patients um, uh, can live on the periphery of society a little bit um, and have a lot of social needs. So social workers are critically important. So all this 
this is the, this is basically everybody who ends up seeing us for a curative intent therapy. Uh, and the nurses and the nurse navigators are critically important in helping coordinate all that stuff. Uh, my slide got bored of me. All right. So in terms of how we treat these things, so we rely heavily on the NCCN guidelines. I suspect many of you guys have heard about these before. So the NCCN is basically a consortium of cancer centers across the United States of America. I think there are 33 of them right now who basically put forth guidelines to help try to guide community practices, honestly, all practices, academic is included, in terms of kind of what's considered the best, most uh, excellent standard of care therapy right now. So most of our treatments, are, we try to be pretty by the book in terms of, okay, if this, then that, if this, then that, according to the plan. So if you're, you know, any of you can sign up for the NCCN guidelines, they're free. They actually have a lovely phone app if you want to download the phone app. Uh, but if there's a cancer that you particularly see uh, more in your clinic or you're helping with navigation for, it's a really helpful thing to do. I look at them all the time, even for cancers, I take care of all the time. So rather than getting too into the weeds in terms of how do we do this for every individual thing, here's how I generally think about it. So if someone has an HPV negative cancer, so that's kind of the classic smoker drinker cancer, everyone needs a multidisciplinary evaluation. So we, you, we just described what that discipline is, surgery, radiation, medical oncology, you know, other groups involved. And basically if someone's got a stage one or a stage two head and neck cancer, we can typically treat them with a single modality. So that would be surgery or radiation. Uh, it's never just chemotherapy uh, for curative intent. So the one caveat is if someone has an oral cavity cancer, so that's again, uh, mobile tongue, floor of the mouth, those people need surgery first. They are increased uh, likelihood of curing them with, or with surgery. Uh, so even our radiation, you'll have Dr. Lanning tomorrow who's a head and neck radiation oncologist, awesome. You know, radiation oncologists love doing radiation oncology. Uh, and they will spend hours trying to talk people into getting surgery for, head neck, for oral cavity cancers because it's better for oral cavity cancers. It's different for the other cancers. So if you have a stage, um, if you have a stage three or a stage four B, again, we need multimodality therapy. So that's going to be surgery and radiation, or chemo and uh, radiation, or chemo and radiation and surgery. So we try to piece that together based upon everyone's individual situation. Yeah. So threes, four Bs, we're shooting for curative intent oral cavity, they still need surgery first. Now it's a little different if you have an HPV positive cancer. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. All right, maybe I just need to hear, hold it here. So if you have an HPV positive cancer, so these are mostly gonna be cancers of again, the base of tongue or the tonsils, uh, the base of tongue or the tonsils, it's a little bit different. So for a stage ones or stage twos, it's really complicated actually in terms of trying to figure out what the right path is. And that's the, re the reason is most of our treatment algorithms were based on an old staging system. And so the new staging system, which is the AJCC8, doesn't correlate with that at all. So you actually have to look through and say, okay, the tumor is this big, there's this lymph node on this side of the body, okay, here's what we need to do. But in general, if you've got a stage one or a stage two, you can do surgery or radiation as your primary therapy. Uh, there are pluses and minuses to each. Uh, and then uh, if you have a stage three uh, HPV positive cancer, you're gonna need multimodality therapy. So that's gonna be surgery and radiation, chemo and radiation, all three of them. Um, so that's just kind of a ballpark how we end up thinking about it. Now I would lose my oncology license if I did not put up a survival curve. Uh, so here's, here's where, here's, I, I think I only have two of them. Uh, so basically, one thing that's really important to know is HPV positive cancers have a much, much higher rate of cure than HPV negative cancers. It used to be 10 years ago, I would sit here and because our staging system was different, I, I, people would come in and have stage 4A head and neck cancer. And like, that sounds pretty terrible, right? You hear stage 4 and everyone gets panicky. And we would sit in here and tell these people, so that would be some of these people on this top line, We'd say, yes, we ha you have a stage 4A head and neck cancer, but you know what, your chance, because you're a non-smoker, you're healthy, this is HPV driven, your chances of being cured of this are north of 90%, which like, that's pretty good. Um, that's very different from someone with that exact same picture whose cancer was HPV negative and was a heavy smoker. So it's really, really important to know what people's HPV status is for their oropharynx cancers, because for a lot of people, our cure rates are actually pretty darn good. So again, I asked uh, uh, my nurses at the VA, I said, hey, what do you guys want to hear about in terms of some of the stuff? So here's some acute and long-term side effects you just need to keep your eyeballs open for. So you all have given cisplatin, right? 
you know the glories of cisplatin. So we have not made significant improvements from a curative intent chemo standpoint since the 1970s for head and neck cancers, but that's because the 1970s were awesome. Uh, <laughs> so in terms, of cis, in terms of cisplatin, the main side effects, right, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, cytopenias, people can get kidney issues, so people get uh, you know, a ton of hydration when they're getting that. People can get neuropathy, you can get hearing problems. We're always asking people, are they getting ringing in their ears? Can they still hear things okay? Those are the big problems with cisplatin. Most of them go away uh, after the cisplatin is done, with the exception potentially if you've, if you've boxed someone's kidneys, that can be a long-term issue. Uh, if they develop tinnitus, that tends not to get better over time. You'll hear more about radiation tomorrow from Dr. Lanning, but when we're thinking about head and neck radiation, we run into problems with dry mouth. Uh, you can get trouble swallowing in the long term because you just damage uh, some of the muscular, the, the muscle structures. Uh, people can get taste changes. Those are usually transient, but they can persist to some degree for a lot of people. You can get secondary cancers, usually 10 to 20 years later. Uh, you can get lymphedema, so that all that swelling. Uh, have you guys all seen people get head and neck radiation and afterwards they look like they have like a turkey waddle? So that's just, that's lymphedema, just like you might get after uh, an axillary dissection for a woman with breast cancer. That's what it is, just right here, so we have to deal with that. And then you can get chronic pain. About 10% of people who get head and neck radiation end up dealing with chronic pain in some way, shape, or form. And then surgery, again, surgery is critically important for some people, particularly for oral cavity cancers, but it can be disfiguring. Uh, it can also affect swallowing. You can also get lymphedema. You can also get pain. And then you can get communication problems. You know, for people who get a total laryngectomy because that's what they need, you know, they don't have a voice box anymore. Um, and that's a real lifestyle alteration. So we, think, we try to uh, think about these things, you know, ahead of time uh, so we can prepare the patients as best we can uh, for whatever's coming down the pipeline. So in terms of post-treatment surveillance, so right, you've met that person, you've made it through, so chemo radiation is like usually about seven weeks long. So you've made it through those seven weeks. The first couple weeks afterwards are also pretty heinous. So you go through all that. You're, you're three months into this, they're actually starting to feel like a human being again. You're like, sweet, this is getting better. What do we do now, all right? And so uh, my fellows will, will tell you, I have a rant about surveillance in general. I'll try to save you from most of it. Um, but most surveillance plans that our people come up with, so the things that you, if you look, pull up the NCCN guidelines, and they'll say you need to do these things, they're mostly made up. So we don't have like real scientific data about almost any of it. So it's mostly there to make us feel better and make patients feel better, but it's not, mostly it's not scientifically driven. So that's my soapbox. So uh, people get head and neck exams, so that's with the ENTs or sometimes radiation oncologists, because they need to get scoped. And that happens frequently at the beginning, every, let's say, two to three months. And then the further you get out, the less and less you need to do them. So we I kind of you ballpark it three, every three to six months. They need to see a head and neck person who can do one of those careful uh, uh, fiber optic exams. Um, it, it is critically important to get imaging about three months after people finish their curative intent therapy. So we typically do a PET CT scan, because if you have a negative PET CT scan after your, um, after your curative intent therapy, your cure rates are much higher. Uh, people can get neck radiation. If you get neck radiation, your thyroid gland, which sits right here, can get damaged. So those people need to get TSH monitoring, honestly, for the rest of their lives. Uh, there's a test uh, called uh, NAVDX, which is a uh, self-free uh, self DNA-based uh, test looking at HPV uh, that uh, is used in some institutions. I would say the data on that are developing in terms of whether that's actually helpful or not. Uh, so it's not something that I do in my routine practice. Uh, I know some other folks in the community do. And then in terms of supportive care, so all those things that they needed while they were going through their, their curative intent therapy, most people actually continue to need in some way, shape, or form. So they still need dental. People who have chronic dry mouth are going to have more dental problems in the long run. They still need to see speech-language pathology because swallowing is never quite normal afterwards, or at least not for a while. Nutrition continues to be an issue. Lymphedema, that's when all that stuff shows up. Audiology, a lot of people developing hearing pro develop hearing problems as a result of cisplatin and need to get hearing aids or other stuff like that. And then again, substance abuse. If they got into this problem in part because they were smoking, they were having alcohol issues, they need to get those issues addressed as well. So that's head and neck, mostly what we do in terms of most of our patients we treat with curative intent. Honestly, it goes better uh, more often, I think, than we sometimes give ourselves credit for. And so there's that. Now, it doesn't always go great, though. So head and neck cancers can recur, of course. Uh, when they recur, they're actually the most common to recur in the head and neck area. So our, st our staging is actually very focused on what's going on up here, because most people who die from head and neck cancer die from local problems from their head and neck cancer. But it can uh, metastasize to other locations. So here's you know, a PET CT scan of one of our patients who uh, every place that's dark, with the exception of the brain, is the place where the cancer came back. So that was not great. 
So in terms of our systemic therapies, so unlike, uh, you know, you heard a breast cancer talk earlier today, breast cancer has like a million drugs uh, that we use. Myeloma, I talked about myeloma person here earlier today, like literally a million drugs. Head and neck cancer, we have like five. So it makes it easy for people who are simple like myself because you don't have to remember that much. Um, so the, there was a regimen called um, the extreme regimen, which was kind of the baseline for a lot of things for probably 15 years. Uh, then pembrolizumab, which is a checkpoint inhibitor, came along, surely showed some benefit in the second line setting and then got compared to chemotherapy in the front line setting. Uh, so this again, this is the, my only second, my second Kaplan-Meier curve of the day and I think hopefully my last. Um, basically you can see that the people on the top were people who were treated with uh, pembrolizumab. The people on the bottom were treated with chemotherapy. It's better to be on the top than on the bottom. Uh, so basically the people's cancers did better. People lived for a longer period of time. It took a longer period of time for people's cancers to get worse when they're treated with immunotherapies up front. So most of us, if the cancers come back, spread, et cetera, will lean heavily on the immunotherapies in the frontline setting, uh, whether that's immunotherapy plus chemotherapy or, chemothe or immunotherapy all by itself. There are different reasons to choose one versus the other, but that's, that's what we'll mostly do. Now, unfortunately, you know, it doesn't work cure people most of the time. Uh, there are occasional situations where you have these phenomenal responses and people's cancers don't recur. Um, but that's not the expect expectation. And that's certainly not what we tell people is gonna happen. I think that's disingenuous. Um, but in the second line setting, so if that doesn't work, like we kind of have good old fashioned chemotherapy or clinical trials. So there's a lot of room for opportunities to improve there. So that, that's kind of head and neck cancer in a nutshell. Uh, so one of the things I was also then thinking, well, what are some new things that are coming down the pipeline for head and neck cancer? So one is, uh, is there a type of radiation that's better than another type of radiation? So most radiation treatment machines uh, in the U.S. right now are photon-based. Again, you'll hear more about this tomorrow, but then, you know, if you go to, if you think about radiation, that is the vast majority of the energy sources. There are some, uh, there's a different energy source called proton therapy. Uh, protons are, require uh, much bigger machines, much bigger space. They're much more expensive to build. And there are not that many of them in the US. I don't know what the number is right now, but it's probably in the 10 to 25, uh, 20, 10 to 20 range. Uh, there's not one in the state of Colorado. Uh, so there is some questions in terms of studies that are ongoing, looking at protons versus photon-based radiation therapy for head and neck cancer, and does one yield better survival, better long-term side effects, et cetera. So I'd say that's TBD. Uh, so for head and HPV positive head and neck cancers, the great news is we cure a lot of people with HPV positive head and neck cancers. The downside is we cause a lot of problems for people as well. You know, there's a, there's a cost of what we're doing in terms of you know, dry mouth, swallowing problems, you know, cytopenias, whatever. So people are looking at ways to try to decrease the intensity of our therapies for HPV positive cancers. So can we you know, do less radiation? Can we get rid of chemotherapy in certain situations? And I would say that's an evolving field. It's an evolving field because no one wants to be wrong because the risk of under treating someone is their cancer comes back and that's not an ideal situation. So I think the head and neck community uh, in general is honestly struggling a little bit with this to try to figure out what's the best way to design studies to de-escalate treatments that we also feel is you know, safe, ethical, et cetera. Um, are there medications to decrease, to decrease mucositis? So people get a lot of you know, uh, radiation irritation during radiation therapy. Uh, there are some drugs in development that are looking at ways to try to decrease the amount of irritation that ha well, with, with radiation. If we do that, does that mean that people will have better swallowing outcomes in the long term, lose less weight, et cetera? Uh, and then are there new therapies for head and neck cancers? So uh, are we looking at new immunotherapy? So we have uh, both at the VA and when I'm wearing my university hat, we have lots of second line immunotherapy studies, um, looking at patients who have progressed after pembrolizumab or nivolumab or one of these things. Um, is there something else to do better? Are there cellular immunotherapies? So uh, Dr. Wilkie mentioned uh, these things called CAR-Ts, which are engineered cells that people get, um, get uh, are uh, reinstilled back into their bodies to try to hide, and hide, hide to try to fight cancer that's been hiding. Um, is there a space for that in head and neck cancer? So that's an active area of, of evaluation. And then are there targeted medications? So we don't have a ton of mutations in, so we will get next, uh, next generation sequencing on our head and neck cancers sometimes, but there aren't a lot of uh, mutations that we've identified where you say, oh, you have mutation A, we have drug A, they're gonna go together, great, let's put you on that. Uh, but it's still an evolving field and I think people are continuing to look for those things. So with that, I think I'm gonna call time out on myself um, and uh, I guess I'll answer whatever questions you guys have. Oh, 
Oh, Ryan's coming today. All right, so you got the tag team, Head and Neck Bonanza. Um, with the HPV vaccines, are you seeing this get better or get worse? That is a good question. So it should get better over time. So the, the HPV, uh, HPV 16, uh, 16 and 18 are the, the HPV serologies that are most likely to cause head and neck cancer. They're also the ones that are most likely to cause cervical cancer, anal cancer, penile cancer, et cetera. Um, and those are included in the HPV vaccines. The trouble is that there's a huge lag time between, so you, and we don't have, unlike, uh, let's say like pap smears, uh, which can give you an idea of how things are going from a, like a pre-cancer standpoint with cervical cancer, you know, we don't have that in head and neck cancer. Um, so it should decrease the incidence over time, but it's gonna take 30 years. Yeah. So hopefully by the time I retire, it's because I'll be out of a job anyway, uh, because we're not dealing with HPV positive cancers. So my question is around the smoking while, um is the chance with marijuana use and vaping, is there any correlation with that now? Because I think there's publicly been a shift to higher usage of that in the younger population. Yeah, so the, I would say it's not totally known. People have looked to see whether there is, uh, where I, there's a clear association between uh, cigarette usage and the development of head and neck cancer, lung cancers, all sorts of other stuff. Like that's, that's not groundbreaking. Uh, the, it's been harder to show that with uh, cannabis use, uh, certainly either from a smoked standpoint or from a vape standpoint, I don't think anyone really knows. There does appear to be a correlation between cannabis use and the development of HPV positive head and neck cancers. I don't think people totally know why that is. But in terms of uh, continuing usage of those products while people are undergoing curative intent therapy, I don't think anyone really knows. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Bowles. You bet.